God. Thanks be to God. Going to class with Rabbi Sager was one of my uh, most enjoyable parts of my week for a couple years. Rabbi Sager would walk into class and he'd set down his uh, bag on the table and he would uh, kick back, lean on something, smile at us, he always smiled, and then he would uh, begin with a snippet of some 6th century Jewish poet or a 4th century mystic or something. And uh, you always wonder where he got, came up with these things. And one day, near the beginning of, of having class with Rabbi Sager, he, he kicks back, he smiles, and he asks, who can tell the story of Esther? Well, I'm sitting there with a bunch of other people who are pastors in training, and I think one of us, well, no one else is volunteering. Okay, fine, I'll do it. So I raise my hand, yeah, Andy, can you, can you tell the story of Esther? And so I tell the story of Esther. You, you probably know the story of Esther as well. Esther was uh, selected as the most beautiful woman in the land to be the queen uh, of the king of Babylon while the Jewish people were in exile. And while she is queen, uh, there's this fellow named Haman who decides that the Jews are not being respectful and need to be, the land needs to be rid of the Jews. And so he goes to the king and he says, King, there's this group of people living in our land and they're not being respectful to you and to our gods. We should get rid of them. And the king signs something and says, okay, you can get rid of them. And what, what date would you like to get rid of them? They, they draw lots, they pick a day down the road, 12th month, Aldar, we're gonna do it that, that month. And uh, 12th month, 13th day. And be able to slaughter all this people. It turns out the people are the Jews. And, and the queen uh, hears of this, and the queen uh, hears of this, and, and she goes to her dad and says, ah! And, and her dad, Mordecai, says, for such a time as this, it may be that you are queen. For such a time as this. And so she takes her life into her hands and goes in front of the king and says, uh, help! That's my translation. And, uh, help! And, and the king says, okay. And, and the king saves the Jewish people, yay, Esther. Story of Esther, right? That's the story of Esther. And Rabbi Sager, who's been kicked back, just listening, smiling, says, but, but Andy, what about the rest of the story? And I think to myself, what rest of the story? I thought, the Jews are saved, everything's great, right? What, what, the rest of the story, right? There is more at the end of Esther. Mordecai, that'd be Esther's dad, wrote letters in the name of the king, sealed them with the king's ring, and sent them my mounted carers, couriers riding on fast steeds bred from the royal herd. By these letters, the king allowed the Jews who were in every city to assemble and defend their lives, to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate any armed force of any people or province that might attack them with their children and women. On a single day throughout the month of King Assyrius, on the 13th day of the 12th month, the month of Abar, the day that they had selected to kill all of the Jewish people. Then Mordecai went out from the presence of the king wearing royal robes of blue and white, and the whole city of Susa shouted and rejoiced. For the joys there was light and gladness, joy and honor. What has happened is the king had signed a decree saying that all these folks could kill the Jews. And what, when Esther had said to him, help, what he had had to say was, I can't unsign it. But what I can do is sign a new decree that says you can strike first. Right? And so that's what, what happens. This decree goes out. And uh, the enemies of the Jews hoped to gain power of them, but that had been changed to a day when the Jews would gain power over their foes. So the Jews struck down all their enemies with the sword, slaughtering, destroying them as they pleased. The king said to Queen Esther, sort of an after-action discussion, well, how did this go? In the city of Susa, the Jews have killed 500 people and the 10 sons of Haman. What have the... Now, what is your petition? It shall be granted to you. You want anything else? And Esther says, If it pleases the king, let the Jews who are in Susa be allowed tomorrow to do according to this day's edict. You know, king, we didn't quite get them all. Could we have a mopping up operation? Right? We didn't slaughter enough people on day one. Could you give us another day for a free-for-all? And the king says, Okay. Right? And then uh, the Jews to this day celebrate this as the uh, holiday of Purim, because Purim is the word for lots, the random chance by which they chose the day that they would all, that Haman wanted to slaughter all the Jews. 
And so to this day, the, the, the Jewish uh, celebration of Purim is the day of celebrating the story of Esther. It'll be March 11th and 12th next year. Two days, because they had two days to slaughter people. Right? And, and so Rabbi Sager tells the rest of the story, and, and, and it became the, sort of the point of beginning to talk about how do you read Scripture. Right? Because you read the story of Esther, you tell the story of Esther, and if the Hallmark Channel was going to make the story of Esther into a movie, what would they tell it as? They'd tell it as the version I told first, right? Then Esther asked, please save my people, and the king said, yeah, yippee, and the credits roll. But that's like a sanitized version of scripture. It's too clean. It's too neat. It's too tidy. That's not actually what the Bible says. Right? Rabbi Sager taught me that day, and it's something I have never forgotten, this idea of the need to break the ear. Have I ever used that phrase before? Have you heard that? Breaking the ear. Right? You get used to hearing something a certain way. And to break the ear is to be able to hear it in a new way. Break the, all your old, old assumptions and to hear it fresh and new. And, and w the way I can tell I'm doing it that I need to really focus on this is when I start reading something and I start skimming because I've read it before. You ever, you, so you're reading the parable of the Good Samaritan and eh, you know I, I know how this goes. Moving on. Right? You, you do that, right? You're not reading what the Bible says. You're reading what you remember the Bible saying. And, and Rabbi Sager reminded me in the entire class with that wonderful smile. It wasn't mean. I just was the case example for this trend that uh, we all do. right? Break, we need to break the ear because we believe this to be the word of God for the people of God, the words that bring us life, hope, joy, forgiveness, purpose, but this is not a clean book. And to read it, we have to read it breaking the ear so that we can hear what it actually says, not just what is comfortable. So the story of Esther ends in somewhat of a mess. Matthew, we have a, a messy passage here in Matthew, a, Matthew, a passage that is not comfortable. Here, read this, hear this passage again. Keep awake, therefore, if you do, you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. Understand this, if the owner of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake. Therefore, you must also be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected hour. The, the parallel structure of that paragraph lays it out pretty cleanly, right? What is being compared? Son of man is coming like a thief is coming, right? The comparison here is between Jesus and a thief. It's not a comfortable passage to read, and in fact, one of the books on the study of the parables I was reading just like skipped it, right? We're not even going to touch it. It's, nope, moving on, right? It is not a particularly enjoyable little comparison to make. It'd be easier to sanitize it, move on, and, and just kind of slide right past it. But how, do, how could we read this? How do we read this, and how do we read it faithfully? First of all, to read anything, you've got to read it in context, right? Th this comment comes up at the time at which the disciples have asked Jesus, so, What's next? Right? They've got to Jerusalem. Uh, Last Supper, all that's about to happen. It's about to be a very Easter weekend. Right? Everything's about to go down. And, and so they know this. And so they, the disciples asked, what's next? How are we going to tell well, the signs of the times? And so Jesus starts to tell them. He tells them, many people will come to you and will try to mislead you in my name. There will be wars and rumors of wars. Nations will fight famines, earthquakes. Right? You who follow me will be hated. There will, will arise false prophets, and the love of many will grow cold. But those who endure will be saved. Now, when you see the abomination of desolation, of reference to, to Daniel, uh, the book of Daniel, run for the hills, and anyone who says, there's Jesus, is lying, because when Jesus comes, there's not going to be any question. Right? Anyone who says, there's Jesus, it, that's not him. Right? Uh, so learn the lesson of the fig tree. Jesus points out, learn the lesson of the fig tree. When you see the shoots on the fig tree, you know it's almost summer. You know how to read the seasons, right? Read the seasons just like the fig tree. And, the, and this generation or this people will not pass away before this all happens. Yet, only the Father knows the timeline, and y'all are going to be like the people in Noah's day. It started raining and raining and raining, and they just said, hmm, it's raining. 
wonder if it'll rain tomorrow. And they just didn't even notice it was raining until the water's up to their necks and they say, oh, I think there might be a flood. Right? They didn't realize, they, they were oblivious. And so Jesus is really all over the place here. He is saying, it's going to get bad, learn the signs of the time, but only the Father knows the timeline, and you all are going to be just like Noah, the people in Noah's day, and you're going, to, you're going to whiff. You're not going to understand. And then right smack dab in the middle of that, we have this little note right here. Right? We have this message about uh, Jesus is coming like a thief. Like a thief. Um, how do we make sense of this? Right, I was trying to break my ear, trying to understand this, how, trying to get my mind around this. And what I often do when I'm trying to understand a passage and trying to, I try to make the movie version of it. And what would this look like? If I'm saying Jesus is like a thief, we're coming up on Halloween, right? And if someone goes like a thief for Halloween, what would they look like? That. I kind of turn, what does it mean to say Jesus is like a thief? You look at that, and that's oddly unsettling, isn't it? Exactly. That, that, that's part of this passage. It's oddly unsettling. It's oddly unsettling in, mid, in the midst of a very oddly unsettling little passage talking about the end times where we're told we're going to know, but we're going to whiff anyways. And so how do we understand that Jesus is like a thief in this context, talking about the end? Jesus is like, to say Jesus is like a thief is not to say Jesus is a thief, but to say like means there's going to be some places where he is similar and places where he is not. And so let's figure out what a thief is. A thief is someone who takes what is not his or hers, a thief it comes unexpectedly, and a thief is not welcome. Is that a pretty good definition of a thief? Right? Takes what's not theirs, unexpected, not welcome. How is Jesus like any of these? Does Jesus take what is not his or her, not his? Well, well, no. Jesus is not like a thief in that he takes what is not his because Jesus does not come to take, but to give, to give forgiveness, abundant life, uh, an opportunity to be a citizen of the kingdom of God. Jesus is not like a thief in that a thief takes and Jesus does not. Okay. How else? What else do we know about a thief? Right? Jesus, uh, a thief comes unexpectedly. Is Jesus like a thief in that his second coming is unexpected? Yeah, that seems to line up with what we're reading here. right? We don't expect to be woken in the middle of the night. You know that moment where you wake up in the middle of the night and you hear some noise out there and you think, is someone in the house? And it's all dark and you, th you sit there just listening really intently and you're not sure if you're awake or asleep but you're worried. You know that horrible moment? Yeah, you don't expect to have those moments. The coming of Jesus is unexpected like those moments are unexpected. And I think that lines up with what we're reading here. Right? Jesus goes to great lengths to say, all the signs are going to be there, but like the people in Noah's day, you're not going to make sense of it. And then right after this passage, we get uh, Matthew 25 where Jesus talks about how you will be judged based upon whether you fed me when I was hungry and clothed me when I was naked and gave me something to drink when I was thirsty and, and to all the people who either fed or did not feed Jesus what do they say? I didn't know I was doing that. Right? The, the whole context here is the, the people don't know. Right? They, they don't understand what is, is happening. And, and so it lines up with the, the, what Jesus has said in this passage, and it lines up with the parable that follows, that we're not going to know when Jesus is coming. It is going to be unexpected. Not going to see it coming. Okay, so Jesus is like a thief in that his coming is going to be unexpected. That leaves the third aspect for the ways in which Jesus might be like a thief. Now, I'm fairly certain about the first two. I'm fairly certain that Jesus has not come to take. I'm fairly certain that the second coming of Jesus is going to be unexpected. The third way that Jesus might be like a thief, the third aspect of being a thief, is being unwelcome. And that's where I'm not certain. This is where breaking the ear becomes important, because it would be easy to say, of course, Jesus is always welcome. Let, let, let's ponder that for a minute. Let, let's see whether that's always true. Right? This is speculative theology. I may be about to be interestingly right, or I could be about to be gloriously wrong. Let's see. If you go out and about during the day, you're all put together, right? You did your hair, you got up, got a shower, shaved, you're looking good. You got your plan, you're in control, you're taking care of business, and that's how you want everyone to see you. That's at least how I want everyone to see me. Right? That's good. You get to the end of the day, you have your, you have your dinner, 
You get comfortable, you take off anything that's sort of tight or restrictive, and you just get something nice and comfortable, and you kick back and relax, and you get to the end of the day, and there's that point, point at the end of the day when you have done everything you're going to do. Right? And the only thing left is either read a book or go to bed. There's that point where you're tired and you've done everything you're going to do, and, and for me, and maybe for you, that's the time if I'm going to worry, that's when my worries get big. That's when my doubts, my fears, my concerns, if they're going to come out to play and they're going to get me, that's it. What's, what about the future of the church? Is Methodist Church going to split? What about the church I serve? Am I doing right by it? Man, i got kids. Am I doing right by them? I mean, they seem to be fine, but am I messing up? How am I messing up my kids? What are they going to have to talk to a therapist about in 40 years that I, I messed them up, right? Because I joke about raising them right, but we all know I'm not, right? It's the moment at the end of the day when I don't want anyone to knock on the door because that's not how I want anyone to see me. I don't want anyone to see me when I am doubting, and when I'm concerned, when I'm worrying, when I'm not put together. I'd rather you see me like this, calm, like in, 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 doing, what, doing my thing, right? This is how I want you to see me, but no, that's not how it is at the end of the day. That's when I don't want anyone to show up. That's when basically everyone's pretty much unwelcome because I just want to read a book and go to bed, and that's when, well, that's when a thief shows up, right? When you don't expect. Maybe that's when I most need Jesus to show up to remind me that uh, my fears are mine, but his grace is greater. His grace is sufficient and that when I acknowledge where I fall short, my weaknesses, my fears, that's when I'm letting him be God and me be not. Right? It may be that this, the third way, right, Jesus is not like a thief and that he, he doesn't take. Jesus is like a thief and his coming is unexpected. We, we know that, right? But it might be this third way that Jesus is, might be like a thief that's the most powerful, at least for me, is that it's unwelcome but desperately needed. I don't, I don't welcome admitting how much I need Jesus' grace. Jesus is like a thief in what we hear in this little itty-bitty little three-line parable. He is like a thief, and I think if we can break our ears and allow, allow ourselves to read and to hear this in new ways, this can be good news. It is good news that Jesus is like a thief, because he's going to show, and he might show not when you want him to, but when you need him.